This Week on Kentucky Afield. Conditions have been tough this spring, but that didn't stop us from getting out and trying our luck. And it didn't stop the fish from biting either. Grow up, buddy. Next. We're working to improve habitat for elk in eastern Kentucky and using some unusual equipment to do so. Then we travel south to Kingdom Come State Park and join wildlife biologists as they check on a denning black bear and her cubs. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. Yeah, we got one, sweet. Got a muskrat? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> what do you know about that, man? That's a good fish, man. Nice male, small mouth, healthy, pretty color. Cody, here. Find us one more good pheasant, Cody. As biologists, we, we catch ducks and we place bands on them. And it's just a really excellent place to see cottonmouths. What do you think? Like bull. That was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Kentucky Afield. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. People often ask me, what is your favorite fish from the state of Kentucky to eat? And to them, I have to say the striper. Today, we are fishing for stripers on Lake Cumberland with Lance Sasser of Sasser's Guide Service. They call this Gross Creek, the name of the creek. We're gonna work our way into it and then work our way out. Okay. You're catching your own bait, it looks I like. I do, yep, I caught those this morning. Yep. Is it uh, mainly alewives? Yeah, alewives, yep. Okay. Yep. Striper candy, they do love them. What pound test you run? 20. 20? Mm -hmm. Yep. Then I use a fluorocarbon leader, but I run 20 on it too. You're throwing a fairly small hook on there, uh -huh, huh? Yeah, a little small circle hook. Got a little piece of plastic on there, a rubber. We put that on there so the point of the hook don't hook into the shad when, when you're fishing. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, if the okay. point of the hook gets not exposed, then you can't hook the fish. Plus, you got a dead shad. Most of the alewives, when you when you net them up, they're all that size? No, right now we're having to sort through probably 50 little ones for every big one. Really? Okay. That, that really depends on time of year. There's times later in the summer where the bigger ones are down deeper. That one don't have any weight at all on it, so it's gonna be basically right on the surface. Okay. In fact, sometimes you'll actually see the striper boil behind it when he takes it, and then the planter board will just take off. Do you vary your weights or your your, I do. And your angle out so you kind of know exactly how deep they're running? For the most part, basically the farther away from the boat the planter board is, the shallower I put it. So, you know, the shallow ones are gonna be over there against the bank, and then the deeper ones are gonna be closer to the boat. So what size is that, about a three? Uh, three aught, uh-huh. Yeah. Looks like just absolute perfect bait. It is. Now this one's got an ounce sinker on it. We're gonna put it about 20 foot of line, so depending on how fast we're going, and that'll change a lot today, um, that will be from, you know, eight foot to probably 15 foot deep. Uh-oh. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Ooh. He's coming out here to check the rest of that bait out. He's not full yet. He wanted to get another one. So you got that drag set just where when they hit it, even if you're not paying attention, you can hear that burning drag pretty yes, fast. Yes, you can. Music to my ears. <laughs> Officially say you've caught a fish on a water bottle now. There you go. <laughs> hey, I well, will you're say, fighting one. I don't say you caught it, but you're fighting one. That is the first time I've ever I've ever 
reel to fish in on the water bottle. <laughs> you know, naturally these fish live a lot of their lives in salt water. They we do. talk about how well salt water fish fight. It's just been in the last 40, 50 years that, that biologists realized they can live in fresh water year round. You're exactly right. I'd say he's not done yet. Barry, make another run? Yeah. Well, not a big run, but he don't like the looks of this boat all of a sudden. <laughs> Well, Lance, that's the reason you come right there. That's it, it, buddy. Look at that. So how old do you think this fish here is? That's probably a five-year-old. Five-year-old fish. Yep. Look at that thing, long as my leg almost. <laughs> Mud fat, they got plenty to eat. Look at that, what a beautiful, beautiful fish. Beautiful fish. What do you think that fish there weighs? I'd say 13, 14. I was gonna say 12 pounds, do you think it's yep. 13 or 14? It does have a big old belly on it. These fish right here have not been in Cumberland forever, but this is a, uh, a true thrill to come down here and try to catch one of these, especially on a planer board with that boat moving. It just, they pull and they pull and they pull. And uh, they're really good on the table, aren't they? Yes, they are, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so this fish, I don't know how long it is. I'm gonna guess this fish is- 32. I'm gonna say it's over yep. 30 inches. And that, uh, the 22 is, is what they have to be to be legal. And this mm -hmm. fish is significantly bigger than that. Yeah, well over. What a nice looking fish. All right, man, they're so strong. There you go. Hopefully we put one more friend in there, two, and that's uh, and that's that's it, two's the limit. For you, yeah. Yeah. So what got you into fishing? My grandfather on my mother's side was a um, big fisherman and just, I don't know, one of the things you look back on and wonder how you did do it. Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. love being outside. Oh, here's one. There you go, right there. Oh, the water bottle again. <laughs> yep, he's still on there. Yep. Ten rods out, and it end up catching two on a Mountain Dew bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Probably one of those 20-inchers. Yep, it's a striper. Yep. I thought for a minute it might be a bass. Uh -huh. That one will have to go back. Yep, not gonna make it, is he? No, nope, not gonna make it. So what do you think that one there is? About 18 and a half, 19 18, inches? 18, 19 inches, yep. Yep. Grow up, buddy. <laughs> well, Lance, I really appreciate you bringing us out. It was a lot of fun. You're welcome, buddy. And you stay really busy. It's hard to get in on your schedule. So. <laughs> yeah. We've been talking back and forth, and uh, you got a lot of unique ways that you catch stripers down here year round. Uh -huh. Yeah. You pretty much march through the end of uh, October. You're pretty booked. Uh -huh. <laughs> I am just about every day. Yep. But someone can find you on, uh, on at your website, right? You can, uh, sassersguideservice.com. Uh, you know, I've never really went out targeting stripers. Uh -huh. So it's been a lot of fun for me. It's a beautiful place down here at Lake yes, Cumberland. It is. So I look to be back soon. Yeah. How do you take over 30,000 pounds of steel and create wildlife habitat? Just watch and see. So Joe, we're here in Breathitt County, and it looks like we're doing bulldozer racing, but that's not exactly what's going on, is it? No, we're doing a relatively new technique out here called brush chaining. We're taking two big dozers and pulling an anchor chain across the ground to try and kill some of this autumn olive. Now we're not talking about a chain you may have lying around the house. This is a massive chain that was donated by Ingram Barge Company, correct? That's correct. It's a two inch anchor chain. All told, it's 360 foot and 18,000 pounds. Stephen Doby with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Tell me what you guys are doing here today. One of the things we do um, year in and year out is try to fund and support these habitat projects to do stewardship on the ground to make a difference for elk, for other wildlife. And so that's what we're here doing today. 
So it takes two bulldozers, and the idea is that you just drag the chain and remove some of the undesirable plants here that may be killing some of the species that we want to grow up for elk and other species of wildlife. That's correct. Autumn olive, it's really not that desirable. It's a non-native, and there's definitely a lot better things that we could have here. And you'll see it makes a monoculture and shades out everything, so that's all it becomes. It's just a massive stand. It's a very aggressive species. It can overtake this open meadow field habitat really quickly. When this plant gets really big, it outcompetes, right? It outcompetes everything to the point where the understory would be non-existent. And if it's really thick, it can even be just bare dirt on the ground. The autumn olive is so thick, there's no fuel underneath it to burn, right? That's correct. We can't manage any of this by fire. And hopefully we can remove enough of it, reseed, carry flame through it, manage it with fire in the future so that we don't have this issue moving forward. We're at an elk viewing location. It's not easy to see elk when they get in here either, is it? No, no, <laughs> not anymore. This is a relatively short amount of time. This is about five years on some of this. Uh, you can see how quickly you can overtake an area and choke it out. Dragging this chain around is something that's done out west some, right? It is. You've been out west with the Rocky Mountain Foundation over the last couple of years. I thought maybe this has a chance to work here in Kentucky as well. Topography is a limiting factor mm -hmm. because it slows things down mm -hmm. when you have mountains. Mm -hmm. um, if you get onto some of these other properties, you could really make an impact quickly. This could be a way that you could effectively treat large amounts of property. It is. We're here in the beginning of March. This time of year is perfect for doing this for a couple reasons, right? Yep. We needed to get the work done early enough so I could still get some good seed in. We're not affecting any potential users of the area right now. There's no hunting seasons. Mm -hmm. I'm not messing up anybody's deer hunt right now or elk hunt by coming in with bulldozers. So uh, it's a good time of year for different uses of the property. There's also not a lot of young of the year out here utilizing this right now either. If you're going to use a method of just thrashing unwanted trees, there could be bird's nests in here, but this time of year you don't have any of that. No, nothing to worry about. Plus it's kind of damp. It's kind of damp. It's good. The soil moisture is pretty high, so it makes it easier to uproot some of these autumn holes. You have to have a way to disturb the plant or the root system. Yes. And that's what the hope is with 18,000 pound chain that you just bring it through and just destroy it. These out of all of are real resilient. The smaller trees, what we've seen is, is the chain actually just drags over it. Mm -hmm. It's able to just skirt over the top and the tree pops back up. Mm -hmm. That's obviously not what we want. So what we found is oftentimes it takes multiple passes in opposite mm -hmm. directions. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it doesn't pull it up, a lot of times you'll see they don't necessarily come all the way out of the earth, but it disrupts the bark system or pull the root system up enough that mortality rates will be higher. It's really pretty cool watching too. When you see a dozer go through towing a chain like that, just destroying anything in its path as far as trees. And this is going to be beautiful pasture land hopefully here in a year or two. That's the plan, right? That's the plan. Try and set it back, have nice grassland areas, better viewing opportunities, better hunting opportunities. It's really interesting too because it was dozers and earth movers that really came in and disturbed the landscape. And <laughs> now we're using dozers and a massive chain to make it more suitable for wildlife. That's correct. This would be a rather costly project for the Department of Fish and Wildlife to undertake, but with Ingram Barge donating the chain and Rocky Mountain Oak Foundation donating the bulldozers, you can manage large amounts of property without chemically spraying it all. Yep, we're trying to get the maximum amount of benefit for the least cost and least manpower. What it boils down to oftentimes is just finding that right tool in your toolbox, and this gives us one more. I think once we get rid of some of this autumn olive, improve the habitat a little better, it will be uh, once again a, a nice place to come and see elk. It is exciting to get to do something new like this, and it's all work in progress. It looks to be working pretty well. You can tell a major difference on what they've done and what they haven't got to yet. I'm pleased so far. We've got a little more time we can put into it and evaluate our success, but I'm excited. Hopefully what we learn here, we can take to other states, especially here in the Southern Appalachians. Now let's check in and see who's catching what and where in this week's fishing report. This is Rob Rold, district biologist in the Northwestern Fishery District. Nolin River Lake is at Summer Pool. Rough River Lake is about 11 feet above Summer Pool. 
Bass fishing's been fairly decent at both lakes. Anglers are using spinner baits and small crank baits in the creek channels as well as the back of the creeks. And Alabama rigs fished on the main lake and secondary lake points have also been producing well. Crappie seem to be holding on brush piles in the 10 to 15 foot depth range and hitting with minnows and jigs. White bass fishing upper Nolan River has been excellent. Also over the past couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of nice bass come out of a couple of our smaller impoundments, Mazay Lake in Union County, Carpenters Lake in Davies County. Several four to five pound bass have been caught in both those lakes. Our Fins Lakes have been doing well. They received their last trout stocking earlier this month. That is an update from the Northwestern Fishery District. Please remember, be safe when you're on the water. Always wear your life jackets. This is Marcy Anderson with the Fishing Report for Southeast Kentucky. Water temperatures are still holding in the mid-50s, and the forecast shows some warmer weather coming, which should help turn on the bite. On Laurel River Lake, bass are being caught on main lake points using jigs and spinner baits. Walleye fishing has been slow, but we've had some reports of them being caught in the evening hours on crankbaits. Crappie are scattered, but can be caught in the stick-ups on minnows and small spinner baits. On Lake Cumberland, anglers have been catching black bass on spinner baits and swim baits. Target main lake points for smallmouth and around cover and creeks for largemouth. Striped bass fishing should start to pick up. They are still up in the creeks and are actively feeding on live shad. The crappie bite is still slow, but jigs and minnows fished around cover is still your best bet right now. Several streams in the district were stocked with trout this week. They can be caught on a variety of lures, including jigs, small crankbaits, and corn. So good luck and good fishing. Hi, this is Eric Cummins with your Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barren River Lake is high and following and about a foot per day. Largemouth are up in the flooded timber and backs of cuts being taken on spinner baits and jigs pitched into cover. Smallmouth are up and near the spawning or gravelly banks being taken on lipless crankbaits. Crappie are, will be on the move up shallow. At Green River Lake, largemouth are up and near the pea gravel areas being taken on spinner baits, lipless crankbaits, and Carolina rigs. As always, good luck and good fishing. The bear population here in the state of Kentucky is growing, and sometimes biologists have to keep up with those numbers by going right into the bear den. Today we've traveled to extreme southeastern Kentucky. We just pulled into a little town called Cumberland. We're going to Keenan Cum State Park. We're going to check out some bear cubs. I've never done this before. Tell me a little bit about what we're getting ready to do. We're getting ready to go in and do what we typically do in the winter. Mm -hmm. So Tristan actually caught this bear this summer up on top of the mountain and we're going in to see if she's had cubs and how many and, and what sex they are. Okay, so you'll end up mixing up a drug concoction that'll put the bear under. Correct. And you can pull the cubs out and do some testing, correct? Exactly. What's the purpose? Tell me why we do this. Population allows us to set quotas and hunting season lengths. One of the big pieces of that is cub survival. Okay. Over the course of the year. So this bear should have cubs when we go in. If we find three, then we'll check on her again next summer. And if she's got three yearlings, then we've had 100% cub survival. I'm excited to see these. I got a million questions. This, yeah. this is the first time I've ever been this close to a wild bear. So I'm pretty excited about going in and, and seeing how this works out. So we got a couple hundred yards down the hillside out here? Yeah, it's down the mountain here a little bit. All right, and you've already located it, correct? Yeah, we've got a general location. We, we had a, uh, a flight done a few weeks ago to kind of gives us a general idea of where she's at. Okay. So we know approximately where she is and then we'll have to go in on foot and actually find where, where her den is. All right, well, you guys tell us how far back to stay and let's get in and take a look at them. Sounds good. All right.
How far does that thing work? If you got line of sight, you're looking at four or five miles probably. Okay. You can hear most of these bears off the top of the mountain. It's pretty amazing that uh, it'll work that way though. Yep. So right now, they've got a signal from this bear. They think it's about 350 yards away. They're gonna try to locate this bear while we're at a distance. You can see by looking at the terrain, it's pretty rough, it's pretty rough terrain. <laughs> And this bear is somewhere where it felt safe with its cubs to try to hide. So uh, it's a little bit of a search and find game here. It really wasn't a bad shot. It was some kind of malfunction with the dart. As it come out the barrel, the drug was ejecting and it just kind of rolled off the bear and it didn't get any drug in the female. She went out the back. Unfortunately, sometimes they do take off. It does happen. You know what, we didn't get the data we wanted from the female, but really this study is a lot about cub survival rate. Yeah, a huge portion of it's gonna be focused on the cubs. So right here, we are literally standing on top of the bear den. The cubs are right here. It looks like there's three of them here. So we're gonna get them out and get them worked up and uh, get them back in their den site. A lot of people would think this would be somewhere completely covered in a cave or something, but look what we've got here. It's right in a big tree. Give me one or two of them. They feel pretty fat. <laughs> yeah, they got their eyes open. They smell like puppies. <laughs> so, uh, is three pretty common? Yeah, three's really common out here. One thing I didn't know coming out here to do this was how we had to beware of scent. Yeah. Obviously most people are not gonna be handling a bear, but so the mother doesn't necessarily get too carried away. Exactly. You know, when we're trapping them, we leave human scent around. It's nothing like coyote trapping. And then here at the den, as soon as she comes back, she'll recognize their herds and not worry about our scent all. Okay. So obviously bears have a whole lot of mechanisms for protecting themselves. One of them is just mm -hmm. hiding in a den with the mother. Yeah. So these bears will den with her next year. They will, as one-year-olds. And then after that, they'll move off on their own. Right. At what point in time, if that mother decides to use a, a mechanism to go up a tree or whatever, can these guys join her? Oh, absolutely, quickly. As soon as they come out of the den, they can run up a tree. Really? Yeah, that's their number one defense mechanism is cubs. Mom will make a noise, and they'll go to the highest branch in the tree. How old that to be before they start having their own cubs? Two to three, depending on their nutrition. How old do you think these are? These are probably a little over a month. That's really cool. So we're gonna find out if we got males or females. Yeah, we are. We're gonna sex all these, and then they're all gonna get a microchip, like the same thing your dog gets at the vet. Okay. So if we catch them again in two or three years when they're grown, we'll know who they came from. So we'll get to tagging. So number one is going to be a female. In a year from now, what do they weigh? 50 to 60. Okay. When they go in the den next year, they put on a considerable amount of weight. This one here is like, uh-uh. Female. Not a female. Male. Well, it's interesting work. You're interacting with an animal that most people don't get an opportunity to interact mm -hmm. with. And I'm excited to see what the results turn out. But thanks a lot, keep up the good work. We hope you give us an opportunity to check back in in a year or two. Yeah. And I really yeah. do appreciate it, it's a great time. Now let's see who else is out there having fun as we check out this week's ones that didn't get away. This is really cool. Here's his very first fish ever caught by Benjamin Johnson, who's two years old in Georgetown, Kentucky. Nice job. Here's Logan Arnold with his first deer ever, a doe taken during the modern gun season in Breckenridge County. Nice job. Katie Lewis started off with a bang. This is her first deer ever, a 12 point buck taken in Mercer County. Nice job. Here we have Jasper Small, who's one of our fans from Tennessee with his very first deer ever, a nice doe. 
congratulations. Do you have a hunting or a fishing photo that you'd like to share? Well, Kentucky Field is now accepting emailed photos of the ones that didn't get away. We will no longer accept photos sent through the mail. Email your photo to us at kyfield.ones at ky.gov. That's kyfield.ones at ky.gov. Our turkey season is open and you have until May the 6th to take your gobbler. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Till next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.